And wait, is this recording? I can't tell. <laughs> yes, it is recording. Good. Everything's working. Everything's working. This is the, the I'm so happy. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, another edition of Learning at Darinister, uh, which is a, well, first of all, Darinister is a project uh, between Henry and myself, Henry being over here and Danny down the line over here um, to create a place for uh, learning and prayer and uh, reinventing things and um, having people hang out in a Yiddish bookstore on the 14th floor of a, of a building in downtown LA. That's essentially the whole point of this. Um, and part of that is to bring in uh, voices and, and, st and stories and experiences of people um, who really ought to be heard because there are some really incredible people in the world and Yvonne is 100% uh a, an incredible person I, i've known yvonne for uh quite a few years now i think since the days uh uh what five six years ago i think back when i was i uh, was um trying to uh, sing at the ucla high holiday services that's where i met uh yvonne um and we've connected on on just talking about how big and amazing both the world is and just the very multifaceted layers of spirituality that are are part of it um yvonne has since and before i met her and since been um traveling the world exploring things that i couldn't even imagine um being uh courageous enough and open enough to explore myself and 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 she came back um as she'll tell you a bit more with a a really profound and beautiful view of, of the world and what needs to be done to make it a better and more uh, a better place. So Yvonne, uh, I just want to give you a chance to introduce yourself, what you've been up to and uh, yeah, and, and just how, how, where you've been and even. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me here, Zach. Um, it's really exciting and thank you everyone for uh, attending. Um, so a bit about me, um, I grew up in the, the California Bay Area and I've always been really interested in different types of uh, spirituality, but um, it was really in my travels that I got to see different cultures. So just to give um, sort of like a broad stroke of where I've been, um, well, in college, I studied abroad for one year in Southeast Asia, did half a year in Vietnam, half a year in Thailand, and I uh, spent a month living in a Buddhist monastery in China. Um, so I got to learn a bit about um, Buddhism there, and um, that really sort of uh, shook up my, my worldview growing up as a Westerner living in California. So that was a big experience for me. And then, the, and then I was working in refugee resettlement and humanitarian work. I graduated um, with my bachelor's in history, and um, yeah, I've just really been uh, trying to focus my career on the human rights based. Um, and then after um, college, I worked for in DC for a year uh, for HIAS, um, refugee resettlement, uh, like I mentioned, and um, and I really loved it. And I also felt like, oh, but I want to be traveling so bad. So uh, then I spent the next uh, two and a half years working on various humanitarian projects in throughout Latin America, um, predominantly in Colombia. Um, and most recently uh, in January, I was studying um, at a seminary in Jerusalem <laughs> and, and a little bit in spot. So that was, yeah, basically my um, overview of, of some of my travels. And, and I just really, yeah, wanted to emphasize that um, I'm not an expert in any of these subjects. Uh, I, I'm really passionate and love these subjects and, and see myself as a student still uh, learning. But um, yeah, I'm definitely uh, not an expert. And as much as I can, I'll try to give other sources of um, like indigenous people or uh, different rabbis or um, different monks that, that you can follow uh to, to learn more directly from them oh thank you no i and you know one thing i want to emphasize is that the 
the the beauty of what's going of what's going on and, and what your experience is is that it, it might you know you don't have to be the expert in one field to have the unique experience of being in very deeply entrenched in a lot of very disparate ones and i think that's just an incredible incredible thing to share if if just that alone and um and i, I guess the first thing what, what i would like to hear um is you know w- i think we talked about three really special uh, places that had a religious and spiritual import that it that that came as part of your travels um what what were they what were they like how did you get into them and uh what did, what was their like spiritual message that you that you that you picked up from them right yes um so each one i would say is completely different um it's the, the three that i'll focus on the most uh today are um, Buddhism in, in China. So uh, I studied under Mahayana Buddhism, um, but more specifically um, humanistic Buddhism. So it, it was very much about what is like the, the implication of our um, like real life uh, day, day-to-day world, um, as opposed to, to sort of historically um, Buddhism has been more about the division between um, monks and laymen, uh, meaning that monks would be spending their time studying and on top of the mountain and meditating, um, and the laymen would be supporting uh, those, those endeavors by bringing them food and making sure they had shelter and whatnot. Um, but I think, yeah, Buddhism really, really shook up the way that I saw um, what I now realize to be um, like a Western sort of Christian hegemony as the underlying fabric of our society. And, and I guess before that, I just thought of that as, as the norm and realizing that no, not all, not all societies, not all of the world is like that um, was my first big like eye-opening um, spiritual experience there. Um, and then with um, Colombia um, and being uh, sort of near the Amazon, it was the spirituality there is um, very uh, intertwined with nature. Um, I got to live with an indigenous community, the the Kofan people um, in the south of Colombia, and they there was really no division between. Um, spirituality and how they saw the rest of the world, which I thought was very uh, telling considering that like the word religion wasn't even created until just a few hundred years ago. Before that, it was just a way that people thought. So to see that they're, that they still really much think that way, that, that it's still just, it's just every part of their life, like nature, it's just, it's the reality of, of what is and seeing that as um, the sort of like focal point of their spirituality was really beautiful um, and, and really intertwines a lot with their, their activism as well. And then, yeah, and then spirituality um, while studying in, in Jerusalem and spot, um, that was really beautiful too in, in terms of seeing it as sort of like a mix of, of certain things that I had seen beforehand. Um, so for example, um, the, the meditation practices that I had learned in China, um, we were meditating for several hours every day and then the final week was a week of silence um, where during those seven days, it's not just not talking, you also can't you use electronics, um, you can't uh, look other people in the eyes, there's no reading, no writing, no drawing, you just have to be truly in your own mind. Um, and the type of meditation that, that was focused on was very much breath based. Um, so it was not really doing some sort of like prompts. It was just how, how quickly can you clear your mind and get to the place of, of pure focus, of pure transcendence, because that's the whole point to transcend this sort of um, human uh, physical world that we're living in. Um, so that, that's what I was trained under and that's what, that's what I learned under and, and eventually got good at after doing eight hours of meditation per day, uh, during this week of silence. Um, and, and clearly other people were very impacted by it too, because of the other, uh, almost 60 foreigners that, that were, 
um, living there with me, um, almost half of them ended up converting to Buddhism toward the end of uh, the month. So yeah, it was definitely very, very powerful, very effective. So that was sort of like my understanding of what meditation is. And then to, to go from that and then to, to study meditation, um, in uh in Israel and and to see that uh the the way that like different rabbis talked about it that the meditation it's for them was not just clearing the mind not just just a blank state it was about focusing on something very specific meditation is supposed to be intentional so um and and yeah with with Judaism like the the focus on God being super central so um, I really enjoyed the the meditation practices that, that we learned there. Um, some of the the Jewish meditation was about uh, using like the the name of God um, and the the different letters uh, Yud Hey Vav Hey and getting to just um, really making it part of like our entire essence, our entire being in, in that meditation and whether the intention of it is to like make us a better person or to um, to sort of make the world better. Um, it was, yeah, it, I think there was a lot of mysticism in that sense because it wasn't just about this sort of like one um, soul neshama that we are. It was this greater entity that we are constantly always tapped into. Um, oh, and the meditation in Colombia, I should also say, is... Uh, it's just so much a part of day-to-day -day life. It, it just blew my mind how normal it was there that like, of course you're going to meditate and of course you're going to use different natural medicines from from the earth to, to help you get to a place um, that that you feel um, that, that intrinsic connection. So those are my experiences in different meditation practices. No, that's very helpful. Uh think in uh, just to uh for everyone on the call my plan or my idea of, of how this works is uh i'm gonna give a, a couple more questions and then the floor will be open to you and just raise your hand through zoom or just i don't know unmute yourself and scream one of any any of those things and uh, don't scream it was, it was a joke that was that was a joke uh <laughs> um you know, and, 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 uh, and yeah, and ask anything, uh, you'd like, but, uh, so next questions, I want to go delve a little bit deeper into some of the things you brought up that I think might catch someone's ear. Um, one of which was the idea of Western hegemony and like how it's how, like the first experiences you had in China, not only were you doing things that we would consider to be maybe in the West, um, unfathomable, like meditating for eight hours, uh, or reaching a transcendence, or, or any of these things. But it was also a big chance for you to to see, like, that the world isn't necessarily, or and shouldn't necessarily be, um, dominated by Western thought and Western ways of looking at things. How did how did the each of your ex, how did your experience like teach you about how present western hegemony is in the world and what what they tell you about how to live with it how to fight it you know any of those things right yeah that's such a great question um i think with the western hegemony piece i at the beginning thought that oh this is just a, a philosophy type of thing like this is i had a sort of a more academic view of it and i didn't quite see then what is the like practical application for for my for my day-to-day -day life um because it's it's very very tied to, to justice as well um in terms of like whose philosophy gets to be seen as valid which philosophies are thrown off as, as just ah uh, that's just what some people over there think versus oh this is the fabric of our our society so learning some of the differences of that were um really interesting and and of course uh like christian and western like hegemony have a really uh shaped the the entire course of our, our world so we can't really talk about spirituality and how it has progressed unless we also talk about power and colonization and how those things have changed the the course of 
um, spiritual practices in, in different communities. But I think one view um, of uh, like sort of like Christian Western uh, hegemony that has really stuck with me is uh, the notions of time and space. So um, I tried making like a little drawing to, <laughs> to help you all out to <laughs> um, see, but yeah, okay, I'm not the best artist, but it's okay. Um, so with the, with the first one, um, let's see. yeah, so this just like represents um, the sort of, um, like progress that uh, the sort of progress that in a sort of Christian capitalist society, Western society that we live in, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be constantly progressing. One step comes directly after the other and it just goes straight. It just goes straight forward, which is very interesting because it means that like time um, is linear and that that we, that we are progressing towards something. And so um, how can that view be seen as oppressive? It, it's, just, it's just a line, right? Um, but um, in this book of uh, The Wayfinders, um, which is made by a, a Christian, not Christian, sorry, it was made by a, a cultural anthropologist, uh, Wade Davis, that I really recommend. Um, he talks about how um, when the uh, colonizers first arrived to Canada, um, they not only wanted to know about the indigenous people's uh, different practices and how they were able to um, survive there, he also sort of, they also sort of instilled these ideas of um, what progress should look like for, for indigenous folks. So it's interesting because indigenous folks in, in those Canadian communities, they there were some things from the, the Western colonizers that they were interested in. They were interested in, for example, learning to, to read and write. Um, the, the, the fact that as when they're like, oh, that's something that like we would also like to have. We have a, a strong oral tradition, but that, that would be beautiful to, to learn um, a skill such as reading and writing. Um, but because of the way that power played out, the way that the colonizers um, essentially, ha yeah, were, did have a genocide and uh, raped and pillaged uh, those villages, because the foundation was uh, a linear um, view of op op oppressive time, that one mm -hmm. step must come after the other. These people aren't civilized yet because they haven't reached the step of reading and writing. And then once they reach that step, then they can eventually maybe someday come to the, the point of like the white man. So that's, yeah, a bit of how- So it's like the inevitability of progress that cre yeah. that uh, like moralizes oppression. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so that that was how that that entire practice was, were one of the ways that that it was justified, but but on a sort of um, like time and space model. Um, okay, so that's yeah, that that's sort of that that first view of of time, and then the the second view of time was when I first learned about in Buddhism. Um, mm -hmm. You can see it's like a a circle that just has a bunch of like <laughs> lines in it because um, yeah, it just keeps swirling around. Um, and so this is the idea that um, in so in Buddhism it points out how in our um, modern Western day society, we often think of time as the past, present, and future. Um, they, they are linear <laughs> um, and they can be divided up into those categories. Um, but Buddhism would say that those perceptions of the past and the future are exactly that. They're just perceptions and it's just an illusion. But because really, truly, as you can see in this like Sort of like circle <laughs> looking thing um, that it's it's more of like instantaneous time past present and future are happening have already happened will happen all at once all of those words it just is 
but we perceive it as linear. So one, one example that kind of helped me with this is if you've seen um, those little booklets that have a little drawing of like a person walking and on each page, it's the person uh, like moving just a little bit more. So if you opened up that booklet to any of those pages, you would see that, oh no, it's just that person stopped. But, but ha by having it move, when you um, like click through the pages, it gives the illusion that that time is progressing. So that's kind of, um, yeah, how, how our society is. It's just, a, it's just an illusion <laughs> of, of time, of, of there existing even a past and a, and a future. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of think of it as instantaneous time all at once. Okay, so the first one, um, capitalist Christianity, <laughs> like views of time. Second one, um, Buddhist instantaneous time. And then the third one um, I learned under different um, sort of like Kabbalist um, uh, teachers of like what yeah Jewish like Jewish time Jewish mystical time is um, and first off it was super interesting to me because whenever we did this comparison of like the West versus the East um, it seemed to me very much that the the different Kabbalists they they see themselves as the sort of like in between <laughs> of the the west and the east um that there's pieces of both so that that's that was striking to me first of all um the second of all um so here's my my drawing for <laughs> number three um buddhist view i mean sorry jewish views of time so progressively growing spirals exactly so progressively growing spirals in that it still has, um, it's still progressing toward something, like there is something that we're, we're going toward, but also there's like repetition in these spirals of things that keep happening over and over again um, through, throughout time. And so one of the, the things that I was taught was how um, like, so much of like sacredness in Judaism is about time and specifically like energies of time. So for example, I tried drawing how for in within the spirals, you'll see like some different colors that um, like sort of permeate in a, in a line uh, where different points of the spirals meet. So you could think of like one of those, okay, like for, for example, we'll take this pink one. You could think of that as like the season of um, Passover, Pesach, and how um, with Pesach, we very much associate that as like the time of freedom, um, the, the time for liberation. And like that is like the time of year. I mean, of course we can fight for that that, that uh, 365 <laughs> days a year but <laughs> and we should but <laughs> that that specific time is um very powerful in 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 terms of what what it can offer and so so basically what the teachers were trying to say is that that the liberation of of Jews in Egypt was able to happen in the specific time of Pesach. Not, it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't the liberation, oh, and then it was in that time. It was because of the time. And then they, there was another example about how um, matzah was brought up uh, much, much earlier, which at the same time of year, but how could that make sense if like uh, there wasn't even liberation? Um, the Jews of matzah wasn't even part of our, um, staple yet and well that's because they would say that um it was one of from one of these dots just like earlier on that it, it just really led so each of the months in this sort of like mystical way have their own power their own energy um that that it's leading towards something so yeah those are the the three different views oh uh, no that that thank you for that uh that and i really i really i i enjoyed all the diagrams and the but the multicolor uh lines on the on the jewish mystical progressive spirals that i that i really i i'm en enjoyed that especially i have to say um uh, you know so i i want to i i want to go to something you've been hinting at and um 
and and sort of bring it out now that we have like a bit of a, a framework of these different ways of viewing time these and and how it it relates to the world and a bit on the spiritual practices i want to go into the question of justice that you brought up and specifically i i think the best way to define justice is um uh, how to fix the world what is considered fixing the world um and why to fix the world. And, and the reason I, I call this, this thing, uh, spiritually rooted justice is because in my conversations with you before, I realized you can make a distinction between justice that's done for moral reasons that like feels like the right thing to do and justices that are rooted in something that's not Western, which is like an entire worldview that suggests that this is what's right on a spiritual or metaphysical level and we're trying to achieve that state of being in this world so could you like elaborate like how does justice happen in these traditions and why does it happen yeah excellent um so for i'll start with the the shamanic communities um in in colombia i think their views on justice are are so much intertwined with um, this this um, this entity uh, which they call Pachamama, um, who is a, a sort of uh, like cultivator of, of all that is um, and that uh, it's the earth. It is who we are, our inherent connection as humans to to nature. So nature for them. Um, is everything it's it's spirituality it's justice it's it's part of who they are so when i was um living with that community it, it was really beautiful um they were working on uh, a documentary called um the um the shaman the the, the last warrior um which y'all can uh, check out if you want to support <laughs> indigenous directors um and so when they were making this um movie it was a very much about um their their spiritual convictions of why they must fight to protect nature to protect um, everything that's sacred. So they were fighting against deforestation, specifically from the, the multinational companies um, that were invading their territory. And um, throughout the documentary, you just see uh, so many instances in which there's no distinction for them between like the physical and the, the spiritual world. And that distinction, it doesn't even make sense to, to create a sort of duality like that. So um, yeah, their views on, on justice is just, it's just because it's just obvious to them. It's like, of course we should like fight for our literal homes uh, um, amongst the trees. Like we can't even live without having uh, like nature that provides for us like in, in any other viewpoint anything else it just doesn't even make sense because it's like you're not even you're not harming just this sort of and I think this would be the western view the westerner would say oh but there's a difference between harming people and harming nature and they would say what difference like one they, they are inextricably intertwined so that it was really beautiful <laughs> for me their their views on on justice and how um, their spirituality is such a driving force for that. Um, so yeah, okay, so that was in Colombia. And then I think justice for, in, in Buddhism is quite interesting too, because um, I mean, Buddhism originated uh, sort of as a response um, in like to, from Hinduism and Hinduism having the caste system of um, there being several different castes and you're you're born into one and depending on which one you're born into that has a strong say in what you uh, are able to do with other aspects of your life um, whether you can be a teacher whether you can be a priest or um, whether you should be a street sweeper, like each of those things are are decided from birth, but based on which caste that you're born into. And also it would say that it's only the higher castes that are able to reach enlightenment um, with meditation. So 
um, Buddhism was born literally as a, a sort of response of this of no, we don't think that um, only the the Brahmins or the the higher class are are able to, to reach enlightenment. Anyone can reach enlightenment. It doesn't matter what how the, what circumstances that they're born into. Um, so that yeah response against duality and it's the same thing with confucianism in in china um like duality is so important to to confucianism and but in buddhism it's absolutely not it's something that um we we need to be able to to transcend and and have a better view of um so that yeah that's interesting too because it impacted um how buddhism has progressed uh it it used to be more so about, like I mentioned before, this um, binary of the the monks and, and the lay people, but um, having the experiences of um, the the monks, I think the the monks, sorry, the monks being affected by the the outside world, um, it in turn also affected them. So. Um, <laughs> In Pure Land B Buddhism, um, it says that uh, the, the purpose of life is to um, transcend this life with, with meditation and to um, be able to not have to be reincarnated anymore, to, to end the cycle of suffering. But how does that happen? That each individual through meditation will um, be able to transcend and to not uh, be born in this world anymore. Pain and suffering, they talk about a pure land, a place where um, the birds are uh, chanting uh, beautiful hymns and the, uh, the sun is always shining. And it's just um, this sort of like a paradise type of place. Um, and for hundreds of years, that, that's what Buddhism has been, sort of striving for that. Um, but due to different um, varying outsider influences and also um, talk within the community, um, a lot of Buddhists started saying, but what's the point of always trying to reach that other Pure Land? What about bringing the Pure Land to earth? To, to where we are. And that's sort of the, the foundation of um, activism in Buddhism of trying to, to bring that, that sense of paradise here. Um, and yeah, that's only existed for, for a few hundred years. So that, that's pretty special and has yeah, shaped a lot of um, Buddhist activism. Um, and then let's see, so that's justice in Buddhism. And then in Judaism, I mean, anyone that's ever interacted <laughs> with Judaism will, will say that justice is a focal point of Judaism. Um, and even Jewish folks who don't have any other uh, real like ties or connection to the community, I hear over and over again, that justice is the concept that keeps bringing them back um, in this sort of collective narrative of, um, us being folks, the, the tribe that fights for that. So um, even just on a cultural level, I think it's pretty pretty intrinsic to, to Judaism. Um, but then on a different level, it's, it's, it is inherently intertied with spirituality because um, one of the things that I, I kept learning in, in Jerusalem over and over again is that Judaism and ironically, this is very similar to Buddhism. Judaism is not about a distinction of duality. It's not about this duality of the physical world and the and the spiritual world. It's about taking the the everyday, the mundane, and elevating that to to spirituality. So um, the everyday of, of having a family, of like, caring about those relationships, of trying to be a good person, that's where you find holiness. It's not this sort of, um, so one thing that one, um, uh, one rabbi said in spot that, that really stuck with me is that if you're a Jew and you go to um, a mountain to meditate for, for the rest of your life, that's not Judaism. Like you need to come back from the mountain and do the work 
um, as well of like bettering yourself, um, bettering your, your community, whatever that looks like. And also I think it's a beautiful thing because it's not about being flashy either. It's not about, oh, did you start uh, an orphanage that uh, saved um, hundreds of children? No, like it's so much of like our purpose of life. It can be something so much small, so much seemingly smaller than that, but, but um but in essence is so much bigger so I just thought it was super interesting how this um idea of transcending duality is present across various cultures um and yeah yeah and, and I think I think what's interesting to me is that the when you break down this duality it doesn't become like a sense of I've got to do the right thing it becomes more of like oh, this is how everything makes sense in the world when I do the right thing. Right. Like it, 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 it like it like it kind of breaks down the invisibility of of being driven to do something and to seeing how everything is supposed to work together, which is, I think, in my opinion, the biggest failing of this uh, capitalist Christian Western kind of view thing is just, you know, you it's it's by instinct that you make things better, not by actually seeing the big picture of how it does, which this sort of. Uh, collective experience does so at this point i'd like to uh, open this up for questions whether from my uh, partners over here whether it be from any of you over there just raise your hand unmute yourself anything you'd like at the end of this this will be available in in podcast form in case you missed it or want to hear it again um i mean i'm i'm gonna be excited to hear it again personally uh, well uh so yeah would anyone want to uh Say hello. I have, a, I, have a, I have a question. I have a question hello. for you. So just so that you can see me briefly. Um, so you grew up in Hayward. And as someone else who spent a, a very significant portion of their lives in the Bay Area, it's a little bit different than the rest of the US. We have so many immigrants from people who are outside of the, of the sort of uh, Christian dominated cultural atmosphere. You know, we have Buddhists, we have Hindus um, who, you know, in, in the, like in the South Bay, Hinduism is a, is a bigger thing uh, than in San Francisco. But, you know, we have these spaces where, where like the sense of Christian, Christian thinking as the dominant culture is not as strong as in a lot of the U.S. So, so was it easier for you to sort of, to sort of, uh, shift out of of that kind of mindset like how how did how did the sort of sort of broader broader than average cultural environment that uh that you you may have gotten growing up uh help you or affect you when you were encountering these other cultures yeah definitely um i, I think maybe I speak for most people uh, that are from the Bay Area, we've gotten to interact with people from so many different backgrounds. And, and I think at the end of the day, that's such a blessing. Um, because it's, it's, something that we see as normal from the time that, that we're children. Um, and in my specific uh, town, Hayward, uh, is 80% Mexican. So it's, there There are like a lot of Catholic influences. Like you mentioned, there's uh, a lot of like South Asian folks. Um, and there's um, one of the most like famous Sikh temples uh, in Hayward too. So um, yeah, I think that um, growing up, I, have been very fortunate to have been surrounded by many different cultures and and that has made me more open-minded to how to work but I've also been a very um sort of like strong-willed I guess kind of person um like when I was younger I I really thought that like this worldview of morality, of morality as black and white, I thought it was the right thing, which is kind of scary looking back. Like I really believed that. Um, and so I think that's why I, I hold such a place in my heart for Buddhism of, of like really showing me that you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to have to be that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you like take a tour around my house, we have stuff from all different cultures. Um, and all different religions and uh ultimately like they're all pointing toward the same thing so yeah i, I would say i'm super grateful for my for my upbringing to to give me that sense of uh, open-mindedness when i know that like 
um, yeah, I can be like a bit hard headed <laughs> about something sometimes, but uh, getting to see, um, getting to see it with my own eyes of different cultures across the world and like how that and the different lifestyles that that was what was most like striking to me. So yeah. Uh, anybody else uh, would like to say something? Uh, this is this is Rebecca Van Landingham, and and I have a question. Hi, hi Henry, hi Zach. Um, so, and 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 everyone else. Um, so I have a question, not only for Yvonne, but also for Zach and Henry. And this um, this question is how in Judaism, what are some of the ways we can talk about time? And my sense of Jewish concepts of time are that time is something that is both important and very difficult, if not impossible, to understand truly and completely. Um, and if that, if that understanding is something that's shared by other, other people, how do we enter dialogues about time and how do we speak about time or what are some of the ways we might speak about time to, to bring in some, some of that sense of the complexity and the difficulty of understanding or the challenges of understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, Yvonne, you want to take a crack at it? Uh, do you guys want to go first? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, Andrew, do you want to go? All right. What else? I'll hear what the rabbi says before this. Okay, well, I'll see what I can do about that. Um, you know, um, one of the most it, this is actually very much related to something Yvonne said earlier, which is these these parallel lines of time. But these parallel lines of time about, let's say, Pesach time, or where it's like the where freedom is more manifest in in time than other times, or um, or the, or there might be other other times like the High Holiday era era, which where our prayers are more heard or we can repent more. These uh, these concepts of um, of like there are specific moments in time that have a certain meaning, a certain significance that repeat over and over and over for the sake of progress. This is something that we can learn to absorb into our lives through experience. And this is what I mean by that. I have a friend who told me um, every parsha, every, every section of the Torah that was read that week, he saw it happen in the world. So if, if it was Genesis, he saw Genesis in the world. If it was Leviticus or we were building the, the Mishkan, we were building the tabernacles or the temple or something, he saw that in the world. Um, if it was Passover, he saw that in the world. Um, you know, a lot of people look to this kind of thing in astrology. They say, well, when if this is this month or that month um, or with this astrological sign being dominant or that one being dominant, they see that in the world. And... It normally, I think that we have a lack of comfort with the idea of like, of like forces, big forces in the world that make things more likely to happen or less likely to happen. It seems to be a little contradictory to free will or to like just straight progress. And that can make people uncomfortable. But we find that actually in moments of chaos and moments where progress doesn't seem obvious anymore or or like there's there's a lot of questions to that. Uh, people find that it's actually easy to hold on to, to repeated moments in time. So there are seasons, the spring, winter, fall, and so on, or, or the holidays that come up, or the parshas that are read, or the stars that are in the sky, and say like straight linear progress that's not so obvious right now uh, is difficult to fathom, but I can always look for and sense this particular element of my tradition in the world and and cling to that and learn from that you can't really learn from straight progress that that doesn't have any particular lessons or themes 
attached to it. But you can always learn from like an astrological sign or from the partial of the week and see how people behave and react and see how you're changed and see how you move. So it's just an emphasis of living your life, looking for the way the whole world moves one season to another. That's how, that's how to challenge the concept of time. By, 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 by actively talking about and thinking about the seasons in which we live and how it changes everything and to, to the point that it really becomes real for us. That's my answer to that. Oh, do you want to take a crack at it? So I'll talk about it a little bit differently than, than Zach, but um, in a way that goes back uh, somewhat to, your, to the chart that you, uh, based, you based your understanding of your spot Kabbalist uh, rabbi, um, in modern Hebrew, you know, if you go and take a class in modern Hebrew, they teach you past, present, and future. There are the three tenses of Hebrew, past, present, and future. And so that implies that in Judaism, we sort of like think in this Western, in this Western sense about time that, you know, there's the past, there's this present moment, and there, and there's the future. But in biblical Hebrew, uh, we don't actually we don't actually have the kind of distinction between present and future that that we have in modern Hebrew and and in fact even even through sort of uh, Mishnaic the Mishnaic period I'm not sure how clearly where where it starts to come in uh, we only have this sense of like what hap what has happened and what is what is coming into existence um, so there's so there's like these these two distinctions so if you look if you you want to hold up your picture uh, <laughs> for me um, so so if you look if you look at the picture you have you have precisely this uh, the sort of sense of like things moving forward and things moving and things moving in a circle because uh, you know, as we read the Jewish, as we read the Jewish text, and as we interpret this sort of uh, you know linear going forward Western thing, we're also stuck in the psychology of of the Hebrew Bible, which and of the Mishnah, which doesn't which doesn't take us in that kind of direction. It's it's spinning us around, um, and. I think a Kabbalist would, would maybe approve of this, but I've never actually, I'm not citing anyone. Um, so, I, so I feel like I'm somewhat, I'm somewhat on weak ground, um, but I, I feel like if you, if you look at these different seasons of the year and what comes from them, you know, particularly like the example of, the example of Pesach, um, I was just looking at a, at a text in, in uh, Mephilta de Rabbi Ishmael, and there's a discussion about like, what do you do? You know, you're trying to figure out the how to adjust the calendar so that so that Pesach and spring are always at the same time, because Pesach and spring, and spring and Pesach, it's like you get like like you can't you can't have just just one of them. They have to be together. So you really have to get that together. So. I feel like the the elements of the past, um, the sort of you know, we're always referring back to uh, Yitzhak Mitzrayim and various various things that have uh, the Exodus from Egypt. Uh, we're always referring back to these things, and I I sort of look at these these events as like fruit trees, and they bear their fruit in season, and so and so like. And so like that, that thing that happened in the past is, is like yielding its fruit progressively into the future. So, so you have, so Jewish, Jewish time is weird. <laughs> Jew, Jews, are, Jews are partaking of more than one idea of time and we're, and we're always trying to fix it to make sure that it like doesn't, that it doesn't come out of its time. So that's Jewish time for me anyway. <laughs> Yes. And I mean, to clarify what he was saying on that is that is that when Jews fix their calendar, they make sure that the holidays and the seasons align and they, they do certain things to make sure that happens to keep that consistency. 
Um, but Yvonne, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that or. Yeah, um, it, it's a really good question. Uh, Rebecca, I think that one of the, the pieces that I keep going back to is, um, well, when you're saying, how can we have conversations about this? Because that's something I'm also really interested in and how to have a dialogue, especially with people from different backgrounds um, on, on talking about something that I think for a lot of people, this would be such a strange <laughs> concept and stuff to, to talk about. So I think first off, like naming the strangeness, the weirdness of um, and bringing a, a sort of comparative lens, like, hey, did you know that like these other cultures think this way that actually our own culture uh, like thinks this way and bringing a name to it, I think is super underrated and also really important to just know that um, like, yeah, there's a sort of craziness and we have to put a name to it. <laughs> um, hope so. And another piece uh, I was thinking with the time um, part is that I think it's um, sort of socially unacceptable in, in a lot of um, spheres to, to talk about reincarnation. Um, but when I was uh, studying in, in Spot in Jerusalem, that was something that came up so many times. Uh, this is sort of, and like that's the ultimate break of <laughs> linear time right there because it's, um, it, it just brings like so much purpose of, of different kinds of times. What is this time right now here for? And, um, and thinking about how even reincarnation isn't even linear. Uh, so I think, yeah, Judaism, I, I definitely still have a lot more to learn on it, but I think it has like so much depth to, to offer on those subjects. Oh, no, I, thank I think you. that's right. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Rebecca. I was just going to say thank you so much, and I had a follow-up thought slash question. So we've talked about the the growing spirals and 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 the picture that uh, Avon so, so nicely drew, and it also seems to me that a lot of Jewish descriptions seem to have this idea that time is something you can kind of travel around in, maybe where you might have. You know, Moses in the back of the study hall uh, in Talmudic times, or you have um, the concept of Shabbat as being an island or a palace in time. Um, and I was wondering if you might address about how we might bring that into our uh, descriptions of the, um, I call it the strangers or the uh, complexity of, of how, how we see and attempt to describe time. And, and why it's important to us. Uh, fine, go ahead if you'd like. Uh, or, then, then I will let other people ask questions. You're just trying to make it easy for us, right? I mean, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, to answer that off, off the bat. Um, every, every conception of time is, is very difficult intellectually, but it's much easier to live it's much easier it's much easier to understand these things when you live them and that's why i thought it was very important to bring yvonne here because not only is she uh she has thought these things through but she's also lived them so she went from going to translate experience of of this time into a graph and and a set of explanations that people taught her and then she's teaching us about about how to do that so uh i think that i think that um uh this is the, the window to understanding these things is, is fortunately right present in front of us. Uh, that's, that's my, that's my take on that. Uh, well, Yvonne, what, what did you, Yvonne, what did you actually, uh, I mean, did you get specific teachings uh, from, from the studies that you were, that you were doing when you were in Israel in Jerusalem and Svat? Uh, re relating to time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and that's where my whole chart <laughs> idea came from, actually, because I was explaining to um, someone in, in, in this community, um, my, my Havruta, I was explaining to them the, the sort of ideas of time um, and spaces they related to um to buddhism and then they were like oh that's so interesting in judaism it's more like this and then i was thinking about how um through my experiences 
just yeah how I view um western capitalism and, and how that time looks like too but honestly I think my um my biggest um like influencer of, of how I, I view time is through meditation. It, it's been like one of the most, if not the most powerful tool uh, to sort of have that visceral experience of, of what does it feel like of uh, being able to, to transcend time for, for however long it was. Um, so yeah, I don't know so much about the the philosophical aspect, but for my like literal lived experiences, yeah, I, I like feel it very, very deeply. Um. Yes, thank you. And uh, let me yeah. let me just ask, did, <laughs> just in terms of of uh, maybe Shabbat observance, uh, did you was there a different sense of how how time worked in Jerusalem and how it worked in Sfat? Um, were you there? Were you there long enough to sort of take that into account, or am I asking too much of you? <laughs> um, maybe I didn't get to pick up too much on the differences between Jerusalem and Sfat, but I will say there was something um, that I could deeply feel about, like the energies of Shabbat in those places that was different than anywhere else it had been in the world. And, and I've heard so many people say, say the same thing. But for me personally, it was when I tried meditating on those days, um, the, the results were, were incredible for me, um, in, in terms of me being able to like get to this like place, this moment much, much faster. And I think part of it is also because of not using electronics, because I noticed the same thing when I was living, um, in, in the monastery that week of not using electronics. And for me as an extrovert, not interacting with other people and not having my spiritual, um, or social energy dissipate having it just be welled up inside of me that gave me so much um, power and endurance to to meditate on a more profound level and to to really go to that place so yeah I definitely had that same um, but I would go as far as saying not just same but sort of um, what's the word um, just on an even deeper level in, in Israel um, on Shabbat. Yeah. And, and I think that that's where I really see that magic of, of time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think um, I want to see if, if anybody else uh, has a question to give off. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll take a couple more. Um, if anybody has, uh, and if not, uh, yeah, we'll move. We'll, we'll see what happens from there. And we'll see if anyone else is uh, interested in asking something. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if you found like any sort of common ground between the three different religions. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I think the common ground comes from once you start incorporating the mystical pieces, uh, like maybe at just like a front view, maybe they don't seem that similar, but once you get to the mystic pieces of each one, oh, they're also similar. Um, and in terms of yeah, how they view energy and like how, um, in, in spirituality. And also, I think that they're, they're similar in, in terms of like hinting at the, this, the same entity, um, whether, whether it's called God or, or the universe or um, nature, that the, each of them uh, very much go into how this is the experience that, that all humans are living and whether we see it or not um, is, is up to, to each individual, but it is right there in front of us if we want to open our eyes and, and tap into it. Um, so yeah, I think all three of them have a lot of magic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and maybe, uh... Maybe one more question if anybody is uh, is so curious. Uh, 
from the field. Uh, doesn't. Well, doesn't look like it so far. So, um, you know, for from this point, uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Yvonne, for for joining us and for everyone for coming. Uh, this was a really mag. This, as you said, uh, a magic. I did. I, I did enjoy the magic myself. Um, and I, I think it 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 showed us a, a great lesson of what there is to to see when we go and explore the world with an open heart. And uh, um, and anyway, so so that 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 concludes that um, the the yeah oh that's right Wait, I I should mention about next week. Thank you. Um, next week we'll have my friend uh, Josh Kogan talk about the Jews of Mexico, the history of, He's not of just your friend. He's my friend. Uh, our friend, our friend Josh Kogan. Yeah, that's right. Um, and um, yeah, he'll be talking about the history of the Jews of Mexico. But for now, um, this this uh, episode will be available uh, as a podcast soon enough. Um, and yeah, and uh, thank you for all for coming. Thank you very much for hosting, and, and thank you to all. All right. It's yeah. nice to Whoa. nice to see all of my friends from San Francisco. Yeah. And now I'm going to quit recording. And oh, good. now we can shoot.